You are listening to The City Vent, proudly sponsored by the Westview Motor Company, supplying your new and used cars. Find us at westviewmotorcompany.co.uk. Hello everybody, welcome to episode 8 of The City Vent. Uh, we've got some uh, fantastic guests on today. We've got Dara McAntony and Phil Eidson. Uh, so Dara is the chairman at Bosch or Peterborough. And Phil is a Bradford City fan, uh, exiled in the USA somewhere. I'm not quite sure where, but he's over that way. Um, so welcome, guys. How are you both doing? Oh, Cheers, Adam. Adam. Good. Uh, what, what time is it where you are, uh, Phil? Are you, are you in the UK at the minute? I'm in the UK, so yeah, I'm just the same as you. I'm in the UK for the next Brilliant. month. It's, it's too early, lads. It's, it's, it's too early for all of us. Way too early. Sunday mornings are like a lie at least 11. You know what I mean? You've got, you've got to sort of... Early time early. you're available. You're a busy you know, man. I, uh, you? yeah, it's, it's yeah, listen, it. listen, it's Sunday. It's triple the rate you got to pay me today. So, uh, you know, <laughs> Sunday hours. <laughs> That's it. So this is what you're all paying for sponsors to get Darren on his, uh, his absolute <laughs> fortune. So, yeah. Um, so we've got loads we want to speak about naturally. Uh, the first thing that we'll speak about, though, is obviously the recruitment at Bradford this season. Uh, as fans, it's looking really positive, um, really exciting, to be honest. There's f- 15 new players, I think, now with, yeah. uh, with Dan Oliver coming in. Um, I'll go to yourself, Phil, and then we'll come to Dara, see what your thoughts are. Phil? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really encouraging, isn't it? Um, you were going to York yesterday, you didn't know anyone who was on the field hardly. They're all the new players. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they all gel together because there's so many new ones in at one time. But the quality, you know, it's been interesting when we looked at the end of last season and we're kind of clamoring for people like Poddy and Elliot Watt and Charles Vernon to stay. But, you know, if we want to progress out of this league, those are going to be average players in this squad. And so it seems like they've been well replaced. Um, there isn't a great deal of gaps. Maybe maybe a left winger left to go. Um, but I've been really positive. I mean, there's some, um, you know, some pace. There's uh, obviously some height. You know, he's, he's buying plays for his formation, but also to be pretty flexible. So um, we're looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, you're always encouraged and always excited at the start of the season, thinking that, um, you know, all these new players are going to be the ones that do it. And who knows where we'll be in a month's <laughs> time. Um, but I'm encouraged by it, at least. So who, who stood out to you yesterday then? Because obviously we both went to the game. Um, yeah. who, who stood out to you uh, individually? Because is, is it the first time you've seen these new players? Yeah, it's the first game I've went to since September. Um, I mean, I think that Smallwood in the centre of the park just... What basically walked around and still looked better than everybody else by a country mile. Um, yeah. Who else was there? You know what actually impressed me and is a, a, an existing player was Kian Scales. Um, you know, he looks like he's put some weight on. He actually looked like he was pretty strong, and he would he'd be somebody who I'd have had, um, you know, out on loan, and he may still end up on loan. But um, I was encouraged by him. I'd kind of given up on him a little bit, and um, you know, he did quite well. Um, the rest of them, I don't know, it's too early to tell. And the game was so easy for them um, yesterday that everyone just looked in control. What do you yeah. think? I'd, I'd agree with you, Smallwood, for me. I, I put a tweet out. It was just, it just everything offensively, defensively, wanted the ball all the time. And it was just dictating the whole the whole game. And you can tell he's like from a level above. And I'll let Dara come in on this one in a second as well, because I know that there was a link with Peter Brewery Smallwood. But um such a good player. I think, like you said about some more players coming in as well, um, Dion's obviously heavily linked from Luton, and mm. again, we'll talk about Luton as well. Um, but yes, it's just impressive to see it. I think when we watched them uh, against Derby, it wasn't as good. I know you probably didn't catch that game. No. Uh, struggled a little bit, but their team's like championship quality, really, I- I'd say personally, compared to us. Um, but yeah, it's, it's good. Positive signs. And, and Kean, uh, one thing about him, uh, he actually trains on his own when everybody's gone home, apparently. Mm-hmm. So he stays down there and puts more effort in and a bit more work on the pitch. And I think he's been doing that for the last few seasons. And it's that commitment, and I think it's starting to come through, like you mentioned. Um, so Phil, we'll fire it to you. Dara, we'll fire it to you. <laughs> okay, now, Phil, we're, 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 we're mistaken for each other, right? Um, it's because the boiler's making it right now. I'm just going to go uh, turn that, it off. That, 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 that's all right. Don't worry. Look. Um, you know, Phil's obviously been filling me in and telling me about what Bradford have been doing, and the recruitment looks uh, clinical, and it looks like it's the right type of recruitment you've been crying out for. And, and obviously, you've got the manager now who knows how to put the pieces together. It probably, when I hear teams sign 15 plus players, it always concerns me. First off, you think it's a Stevie Evans team because he likes to sign 19, 20 players. Every, I was joking with him the other day at Stevenage, and he was saying, Yeah, 19. And I said, Let me guess one more. You know, that's his favorite saying. But <laughs> I, I go back to Blackpool about two years ago in League One. 
when the new owner came in and they signed 19 players. And whilst it took three, four months for them to gel, they won promotion. And, you, you know, so that puts that out the window that you're always worried, well, there's 15 too much. Is it going to take too long? And, you know, is it possible to win a promotion with all these new faces in the building? So it sounds like you're on the right line. The fact you've got a manager who can stitch that all together, knows what he wants, has been quite clinical about the areas he wants to fill. Smallwood was a massive signing for you. If anything is going to press the reset button for Bradford to go on a run and to get promoted finally, to get out of League 2 back into League 1, it has to be the, rich, the Smallwood signing. You know, that's a guy who's got like promotion in his middle lane. Um, you know, and the fact he signed, what is it, for two years for you guys? Um, it's a hell of a... It, three years, yeah. A hell of a signing because obviously Grant now Smallwood, he was his captain. And we spoke in May and he knew he, he knew Hull had an option, but they, were gonna, they weren't going to take the option up. And... We spoke to Richie's agent and him early on in May before recruitment even started for June or whatever else to say, look, what, what you know, what's your thoughts? Because Grant was worried that, look, he, he's got obviously a partner. They haven't had kids yet, but they're at the age where they're now going to settle down or they want to be in an area that's not a million miles from where their, their home base is or whatever else. And it was just pretty clear to us, it wasn't even worth an offer because he wasn't going to come. Even if we'd been in the championship, he still was choosing geographically. And I get that with players that go the other side of 30. We know it's a short career. You have to think of your family. So when Phil told me you guys were in, I was like, listen, that's a brilliant signing. And, um, you know, you, you, you'd not break the bank, but you do everything because he's the type of player that could play four or five years more, you know, at a good level. So you wouldn't worry about giving him. But a lot of 30-plus-year-olds, you don't really give three-year deals to. You do when you want to get them away from higher clubs, like I did with Beavers, to get them from the champ to League One and we won promotion. So that's a standout signing. The boy you got from uh, Gillingham, the striker, you know, he could be that 20 goal a season as long as, you know, Touchwood stays fit that you've been kind of lacking and desperate for the last, what, two, three seasons. Um, you know, he's a good player. I was never sure about him top end of League One or in the championship, but at League Two level, he should eat that level alive. I don't know how he's looked in the preseason games, but I'll finish by saying this without waffling on. Barry Fry always tells me, Ignore what you fucking see in preseason. It's absolutely no bearing on how good your team is, how shit your team is. You know, and after watching us at Barnet yesterday, I'm glad he said those words again. He's for 16 <laughs> years. I still get animated during preseason when we win or lose. And he's like, fucking ignore fucking preseason. Waste of fucking time. Do you know what I mean? It's like the bread and butter starts in two weeks. So, and it sounds like you guys are good to go. Yeah, we just probably won. It's funny you're talking about the fact that you're uh, you got Luton in midweek. So uh, you know, go kind and go nice on Dion Pereira for us because we're all hoping that uh, um, you know he comes back. I think we've got to yeah. wait on the, wait on um, on Luton a couple more weeks in preseason uh, to have another look before they decide if they're letting him out or not. Got you, got you, got you. So that Probably. deal is pretty much like being worked on. <laughs> yeah, it's just a matter of whether they're going to let him out or not, or what level. But you know, if he's uh, if he's made available, then we're definitely in and he's interested. From what it looks like, though, he's having a storm in pre-season for Luton. So it's, I, I'm a bit sketchy on whether it's going to happen, to be honest. I, he, he's been playing really, really well. Oh, He's been playing really, really well. And um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Luton, I think Luton are going to offer him some game time next season. He's mm -hmm. going to stay in put. Well, listen, if he's doing that well, I'll sign him. I'll have a look at him on Tuesday and uh... <laughs> <laughs> I've got a few more of those if you want, Dara. <laughs> okay. We're done. We're done. We're done. No more, no more for us for the moment. <laughs> so on that point, um, talking about uh, Peterborough and your recruitment, I mean, obviously, it's, it's interesting to hear about your strategy because it's something that I personally admire. You know, you get players in, you develop them, and then you turn a fee for them quite a lot of time. And some of the players yeah. that you've had and have gone up and played at the highest level. So what is the strategy that you have, if you can tell us a bit about that, Dara? Well, it's not rocket science. And obviously, a lot of people are replicating it. Or, or, you know, when I bought Peterborough 16 years ago, I was... I was quite an analytical motherfucker. Everything in my life was analytics and data and statistics. And, and I, I built a real estate business based on that model, based on, you know, yes, human emotions important when you have salespeople selling houses, but a lot of it was data driven of that many clients, that many sales, that much efficiency. So when I bought Peterborough, I looked at football and I designed a model I thought would work for us as a club our size in League Two. And a lot of the early model was go and buy 
between the age of 18 and 23, the best player in every position, one league below Peterborough. Because if it was the best in that league below in every single position, that 11 would be good enough for the league above. That was the start of the model. The 18 to 23 was the young and hungry side of the model. And then it's developed over the years where we look above, we look below, we look anywhere. I don't care if it's someone in a pub car park. You know, at the end of the day, we, we would give a player. And a lot of it then will come down to personality. Um, and I always found it interesting years gone by that somebody once said to me based on, you know, books and whatever else that the human brain between the age of 17 and 23 is at the most susceptible stage to be developed. So you could have a 17, 18 year old lunatic, a wrong one, a good person, whatever. By 23, they can change. They can get rid of a lot of the bad habits if they're led the right way, if they're coached the right way. Once you go past 23, 24, it becomes very, very difficult to do that. Hence why you'll never see us sign a lot of players over the age of 24 from, say, lower down. Because you think, well, if they've been discarded at an early stage in their career by a Prem club and they've ended up in non-league, they've got a few issues. Because if they weren't good enough there and they've dropped five levels, there's got to be some characteristic trait issues as well. So we kind of sign them and get that out of them. It doesn't always work. So you don't always win. You know, you, you could sign two or three and maybe one of them doesn't work out. But we allow for that, you know, the way we do this. And, and, and again, it's developed over the years. The other side of the model was we're not frightened of paying a transfer fee. A lot of clubs are always worried about paying transfer fees. We'd rather pay a transfer fee than a big wage. Because the way I look at it is it's an asset investment. And the way we structure the transfer fees, I can live with that. Whereas I'll come across a lot of clubs in our league and they're paying maybe double the wages. Well, that's more of a sleeping concern for me when your wage bill is this, 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 and this, and maybe your assets are depreciating because you've got, I don't know, 29, 30, 31 year olds. You know, so I think in, in my whole ownership, Peter, you signed three players over the age of 30. That's, that's definitely by design, and that's not an accident. Um, you know, and you look at our typical squads, your average age is always around the 22, 23, 24 mark maximum. So it's always done us well. Particularly during COVID, I think we, we did the biggest deal outside the Premier League where we saw Tony. And if it wasn't for that, you know, we'd have been in trouble. You know, like a lot of clubs were, where there was no income for a long period of time. So being able to fall back on the model to help pay our bills at times works pretty well for us. And but again, it's not me bragging. A lot of hard work goes into it. A lot of putting your balls on the line and a lot of opening your wallet goes into it as well. And, and some people can be a bit worried about, you know, you get a League Two club and you're going after the best asset. They turn around and go, yeah, we want a million quid. Most people put the phone down. Whereas I'll start negotiating. As long as I can pay that over years, the fee doesn't frighten me because the upside's so good. And the upside could be five, ten times that number that's thrown on the phone at you. So that's kind of where we are. That's what we do. It's why our squad's probably costing the millions to assemble. But at the same time, if I was if I wanted to sell all our players tomorrow, I'd be comfortable, you know, north of thirty five million bringing in that transfer income. So that that's us as a club. It's really interesting to hear about it because I think people look at Peterborough and the way that you've been on like an upward trajectory, really, haven't you? Um, since you've yeah. been in charge and you've got them to championship, and I think their fans were disappointed that you came down last season, but sure. it was injuries and one thing and another. To be fair, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting to hear that. And one thing I wanted to touch on is a couple of players that are playing now because the money in League One is almost ridiculous, isn't it? Now, let's be honest, um, at the top end. So I heard a bit of a rumor the other day that Jack Payne. Obviously, he's been touted around, and I don't know if you're interested at all in him, but um, I hear that he's got an offer um, of 12 grand. Um, is it a week? 12 grand a week. That's his highest offer in League One. Are yeah. you joking me? Uh, no, no. Um, that's essentially something that I heard yesterday at the game. 12 grand a week. So, yeah, yeah, he's a good player, but, I mean, those wages in League One just frighten me. Is it? Is that something that's standard, or is that, like, way above where it, it uh, needs to be? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I mean, we're living in, in times where inflation is, like, everyone's favourite word. I mean, it was getting to the point where we're paying players like that 12 grand a week. You know, I, I, I'll, I'll hand the keys back and move on. Um, you know, that's <laughs> pretty, no, no, no League One football club should be paying that. And look, I know Derby yeah. County are now in League One, but I think they're under owner that's that's probably going to be a lot more responsible. I know they've signed a lot of veterans, but I, I would doubt any of their players are on 12 grand a week. It's funny, a lot of people throw that tar that brush at Ipswich that they're paying ridiculous wages. I spoke to the chief executive, well, Mark Ashton, who runs Ipswich. He was on holiday. I was in Dubai. And we spoke for a good while. And he said, look, do me a favour. Whenever you get an agent that comes on and says, oh, Ipswich are in for the same player, they want the, he said, put me on a three-way call. And I'll dispel that myth straight away. Because he said, well, you know, what a lot of agents tend to do is it's the local, the newest flavor of the month. Ipswich was the one recently when they had their takeover. Oh, paying loads. This is what they're you know, offering players. I forget who it was last year. This is the game agents play. So 
I don't believe he's been offered 12 grand a week. Uh, I don't believe he's been offered eight, nine grand a week. I heard it in the championship last year. You know, Barry had told me, oh, that player's been offered this, 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 this. And I'm like, no. And, and this was some big clubs like Cardiff and other clubs. And I knew some of those clubs had stuck in a six grand cap. And this has all happened after COVID. In the championship, some of those clubs had capped players at six grand a week. Um, you know, so that's happening in the champ. To hear yeah. somebody's paying 12 grand in League One, I call bollocks. And if they show me that contract, I'll show my arse all over Valley for eight. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, 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 so there is no fucking way he's getting even seven, eight grand a week, in my opinion. Do you think he's, he's League One quality, like the top end out of interest? There's, there's two players I want to talk about. There's him and uh, McCurdy. I just want to know your thoughts on them and if there's a, they'd ever cross your mind to sign any of them. No, um, McCurdy, obviously, he, he reminds me a bit of Marcus Madison. I don't know if that's a personality thing. He seems to wind up away fans a lot. He seems to... My scouts, I've got a gem database, and he was in that database from four years ago. And the comments at the time were, you know, characteristic character-wise, he's one that, you know, you got to work on. And if it goes well, it's great. And if not, you know, whatever else in the camp. Um, he had a breakout season last year. Um, I think it's interesting. Nobody's really offered big money for him, have they, or, or, mm. or done a deal. Um, so he probably needs to get to the stage where he needs to calm down in interviews and stuff. I've seen him like in interviews and whatever. And if you're his agent, his parents, his partner, just go, look, you can be like that in the pitch. There's nothing wrong with winding up away fans. That's what football's about. If that gets you going and that gets you 20 goals, do you know what? Have at it. Tone it down. Tone it down on social media. Tone it down in your interviews. Because they're the things that will stop you getting a move. They're the things big clubs will look at and go, not sure about that in the dressing room. And I've said this over the years to many of my players who... <laughs> enjoy more the social media aspect than playing. And you think, scouts now, they're like, if you see my reports from my gem scouts, and I've sent Phil a couple, you know, I always have my scouts look at a few things, not just the game time. I'm, I want to see them, how they are before the game. I want to see them, you know, warming up. I want to see what they're like with their teammates. I want to see the effort they put in. I want to see how professional they are if they're listening to the coaches. I then also have a thing about what happens during the game when things go against them, bad decisions, whatever else. How do they react? Then I get my scouts to talk to the local fans because I want to know locally what they're up to in the city. So you got a player at Bradford, you know, is he out in nightclubs every day? Is he love strippers? Is he like this? Does he like that? What what are all the bad habits? Or is he someone you'd introduce to your daughter because he's he's that type of guy? You know, they're really important things to know. So, you know, I, I don't know about those two. You've mentioned whether they're going to get big moves yet. Um, it's telling that we're six weeks from the window. Uh, you know, I haven't really seen anything or heard anything. Um, but nowadays in football, the bigger clubs put a lot more emphasis and time into off-pitch activities than they do actually on the pitch. And, and, and that's going to be more and more because when you're paying fees for players and big money or whatever, you need to know the inside of their arsehole, you know, to look for any kind of like skeletons in the closet. It, does that make sense to you guys or, or am I waffling on here? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think um, it's funny though, because it's changed and it times have changed with football. We, we had a famous footballer called Bobby Campbell, um, one of our legends and, um, he was famous for like in the strippers. There was a, there was a pub actually on Manningham hey, Lane above the ground. Nothing wrong with half time. Well, can we all love a good stripper? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, listen, are you joking me? Listen, nothing wrong with that. But I'm just, you know, <laughs> you know, at the end at the end of the day, I don't want my player in there every night. You know what I mean? It's like you know, every now and then, I said to the lads, they want a trip to Vegas. You know, we win the league here. When we win the league, at the end of the season, and I said, absolutely. Are we bring them wives, and they were like, no. I said, do you want me to make sure there's new wives provided? And they were like, yeah, and their eyes lit up, you know, but I was joking, obviously, at the time. So, you know, nothing wrong with strippers at all. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, there's just, it's just sort of this, um, it's coming out again in the news with these players like um, Grealish, he's obviously enjoying himself at yeah. the minute. People are playing hell about it and what have you. But what, what, do you, what are your thoughts on, on that? Because he's got loads of stick, hasn't he, Grealish? I, I, I love Jack. Um, his agent's a pal of mine. And, you know, like my daughter is like, you know, her and her friends think Jack Grealish is gorgeous. So, you know, she's only like 15. And, you know, um, I'm trying to keep her away from footballers, that's for sure. But I, I got, you know, I got I got onto his agent when he got his move. And his agent sent a lovely video from Jack. Because I tried to buy Jack or get Jack Grealish from Nuts from Villa to us a few years ago in League One when he was 19. And he was he was seen as a bit of a wrong end. And were Villa going to keep him? And, you know, there's all that going on. And um, he's a lovely kid. And he gets he gets a lot of flack. Uh, let me tell you, he, there's no one as fit as him. Regardless, you see him out partying with his friends and whatever else. I think he's going to live his life the way he's going to live his life. Uh, I think he'll have a big season for Man City this year. And um, when he was younger, he did stupid things, passed out by the pool, holiday, all of that kind of thing. But 
His talent is unbelievable. And he's a durable player. And um, whilst he does stupid things like during COVID and whatever else, you know, I think there's genuinely a lovely kid in there. And then, um, you, you know, and I think the media and people give him a, you know, these young players get a rough deal sometimes, you know what I mean? The media spotlights on them. And I think it's very tough. I mean, I don't know if you guys remember what it was like in 22, 23, 24, you know, and, and you're expected to be this responsible person and politically correct and do things the right way. And it's it, it's a tough world now, environment to do all of that and, and live the right way with social media and phones on you everywhere you go. I mean, Jesus, if, if a phone and a camera followed me around when I was 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, it'd be fucking, I mean, tell you, you know, it, it'd be scary stuff. So um, I, I don't um, envy any of the players the spotlight they're in. But, you know, Jack Grealish is definitely the criticism too much. People are always just looking, waiting for the moment for the trip up as well, aren't they? Yeah. Phil, like, they do that with everyone. It's not just footballers, is it? Yeah. You know, you're, you're in a business that's in the ascendancy and doing really yeah. well. You know, you, you'll find your competitors that love to see you go bankrupt, you know, and, and, and maybe people that are, you know, acquaintances suddenly see you doing better in life. And I, I've dealt with that all my life. You know what I mean? It's, it's even now, you will get people who've never met me in football who will go, oh, he's a fucking soul or he's a loud mouth or he's a dickhead and da da da. But if they met me, it would be a different opinion. Because as you know, I'm not really that person. You know, mm-hmm. yes, I'm I'm loud, I'm brash, I'm whatever else, but I'm I'm a normal guy. You know, I, I couldn't care whether you drove a Ferrari or a Skoda. It, it, it doesn't matter to me. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm my own success, my own life is, is I don't judge anyone to me. You know, I do things my way. And I always teach my children to be thick skinned and 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 bounce that shit off them. Because otherwise, you know, you let it get you, you know, the crap that people throw at you, you know, it's a tough place out there. So I don't envy any of these young people, you know, your kids growing up in this world and my kids or whatever else. So the Jack Grealish thing, the media, they need to leave him alone because he's one of England's best young talents. And um, he, he will, you know, if, if Gareth Southgate lets his melons hang out and actually uses him properly, um, you know, England have got a serious chance and, and he, he could be the, that special X factor, uh, you know, in my opinion. You know, I love that type of player. I think this is this is the issue, isn't it? Like, we, we, we young footballers, like... We forget that at the end of the day, these are teenage lads going into yeah. their early twenties. Like we've all done things like when when we were kids and whatnot. At the end of the day, we've got to let them live their lives. Otherwise, they are just going to lose interest, and that's when it starts going downhill for them. And the media just jumping on this bandwagon to try and bring everyone down all the time. It's it's, it's it not is. on. Andy, that's spot on. And, 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 you know, all you can do when you own a club or you work at a club is, is you give them the best advice you can, you know. And, and, and I, I say to our young, you know, I remember in Portugal the last week we were on pre-season and on the final night, obviously, I paid for dinner and let them go all go out, let their hair down, whatever. And I just said to them the two words I say to my children all the time, good decisions, make good decisions. You know, there was a lot of stuff in the paper. It was another assault or rape by a Premier League footballer, allegedly, whatever else. And I just said to them all, like, Good decisions while you're all together. You know, don't do anything fucking stupid. Don't do anything to let yourself down, your family down, your club down. You know, you have our trust. Don't lose that trust. Good decisions. And that's all you can do. For sure. So um, just talking a little bit like about recruitment again, just before we sort of close that subject off, it's it's the link between Bradford and, and Peterborough I'm interested in. So there's been a couple of players touted like Elliot Watt that's obviously he was touted to you. And is there any other players that you've been linked with over Bradford over the years that... Um, you've obviously won the race to, or we've beaten you to. Any, any that you can think of? Yeah, um, I think <laughs> you you had Dembele uh, pretty much signed and sealed, um, and, and it's really funny because I was speaking to Grant about this the other day. In Grant's first period with me, we both liked Dembele at Grimsby, and then obviously Grant left, and Steve Evans was with us, and I, I, I'd always, Dembele's the type of player that gets me off my seat, so I'll always be interested in that type of player. So I remember saying to Baz one summer, you know, we were looking for a wide player and Evans is kind of like him and a horn on him because he's definitely not an Evans type player because he doesn't do a lot of work that way. And I said to Baz, look, Baz, do me a favour. It's all going quiet in the Dembele front. Give his agent a ring. So he rang him and the agent's like, well, I'm in the car park at Bradford signing. So I said to Baz, get on to John Fenty at Grimsby, who we've done deals with before. And I said, do what you got to do. And I said, regards to the agent, obviously do what you got to do with him as well. I approve that. And get him in his car and get him the fuck out of that car park. So, so, um, <laughs> but, but, so ba- basically, um, you know, uh, and I can't confirm if any of this is true in case I get in trouble for any of the things I'm saying. <laughs> but, but basically, um, yeah. So 
we we got him. He hadn't signed for you guys yet. He was just in the car park. So uh, anyway, we got him out of the car park and uh, he signed for us. We did very well out of him and and then obviously sold him for a couple of million plus plus and plus. So uh, yeah, that that's one story that you know springs to mind. Um, but in the early days when I owned Posh, we couldn't compete with Bradford for players. They were always seeing a bigger club, and well, they are a bigger club because of the fan base. But financially, maybe not so much. But back then. You know, and I can't remember where Bradford were. I know Stuart and Cole have been around a couple of times or whatever else. But, you know, I, I, I want to say to try and get a player to us over Bradford, if, if it was a free transfer, n- not easy. Um, so, you, you, you know, sometimes I say to Phil, because he talks down Bradford where he's kind of like, well, we're in League Two, mm-hmm. Humble and whatever else. It's fucking Bradford, for goodness sake. You know, and it's, uh, you know, it's a big football club. Any player going there, it should be a privilege for them, right? You know, we do talk ourselves down because you know i think that part of it is you don't want to talk yourself up and then be you know kicked down because you know you hear you are still in league two but it does take outsiders to make us realize how big of a football club we are and i think that you know i mean i obviously you um I, i hear that from you and i think for us mark hughes coming and being manager is kind of bringing that um to the far for us as well. Like, you know, you realize that well, you're a big enough club that can attract somebody like that, but also that um, you realize that you should be competing, you know, against other clubs that you, when you, when you get used to playing against, you know, the, the, the Suttons and the Harrogates of the world, you kind of forget that. I've said to you for the last year and a half, big clubs finally catch fire again. You know, uh, you know, Derby will do it. Bolton have done it. You know, um, uh, Wigan did it. You know, Bradford will catch fire again. You know, whether it's now or whether it's next year. And it's a big football club. Any football club that you have to judge them by championship standards. You guys would probably have 25,000 every Saturday in the championship, right? It's a big football club. So regardless whether you're bottom of League Two or the top of the conference, it's only a matter of time. Um, and, and, And I know that's easy to say. And for the fans who've kind of endured all the pain and whatever else, you know, that's the reality of the situation. But I think you, yeah, I think you're in a really good spot. And to have a manager like Mark Hughes, he's probably pretty much working for, you know, I don't think he went there for money. And I don't think if you'd said, well, Mark Hughes, would he have gone to League Two for Crawley or with all due respect to Crawley or to Stevenage? He wouldn't have. He's gone for Bradford. So the hint's in the name. It's the reason Mark Hughes took the project on. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so sometimes, yeah, you're right. You don't want to talk yourself up. But I tell, again, I tell my kids every day, if you don't believe in yourself, you don't talk yourself up, who the fuck's going to do it for you? And that's, I've lived my life by that. I look at her every day. I love what I see. I'm happy with what I see. Because if I wasn't, who else would be? You know, so, you know, you got to drop all that shit and you got to think positively and talk yourself up. You know, you are the biggest club in League Two by a mile. Do, do you think it's um, an attractive club for somebody to want to invest in and buy Bradford City? Because obviously, we don't own the stadium. We don't really have a zone training ground of sorts. So, is, obviously, as, a, as an owner yourself, what, what, when you look at Bradford, is it something that you think other investors would be interested in? Is it is a project, uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, it's a great question, Adam. And and, and I, I guess this is where maybe it irritates some Bradford fans where I'm, you know, suddenly I'm, you know, always talking about Brian Bradford or I'm talking about this and what, what's he got to do with Bradford? Maybe it upsets Peterborough fans. But it's only because me and Phil have a podcast together. We're partners. So we always talk Bradford Peterborough and it comes up. And then I get asked questions on Twitter. If you were buying into a club and you weren't with Peterborough, it's a bit like, you know, if my wife left me, you know, who are you going to go out and get? Well, you know, my list, is, my list is going to be pretty ambitious, you know what I mean? And I've told it up myself, you know, it's going to be, the, the, you know, a lot of upside and a lot of potential. So if I didn't own Peterborough, you know, and, and I've always said, look, I love owning Peterborough and, 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 you know, I've done really well there. My fans didn't want me there and my own, my partners didn't want me there and I was out there. I'm going to buy another club. I've always said that. Just like my missus left me, you know, I love that stuff too much. I'm going to go get another missus. That's just like, maybe I'll get two. So, so I'm going to go and buy another football club. And, you know, I looked at, you look at, you look at the list. I would always buy potential. I can't afford to buy a championship established football club. So what I would do is I would look at a club at the top and on league in the bottom of league two. And I would go, what's the club with upside? Who's the club? If I went back to back with promotions, what's the growth on the crowds? You know, what can I do? What can I squeeze potential out of it? So I've always said Bradford's the one. Anyone with a fucking brain who knows anything about football if they're trying to do the same thing, they would look at League Two and they would go, who are you buying if you're spending seven, eight, nine, ten million, whatever the price is? Bradford's the one. Uh, and that's what I've always said. And that's got me in trouble. And I don't mean to like upset posh fans or irritate Bradford fans who wouldn't want anything to do with me. That's great. It's, it's all about 
football's all about opinions. Opinions are like ourselves. Everyone has one. Um, so, you know, me, yeah, Bradford's got to be high up there. You know, if you were to go, if, if you couldn't afford a Bradford and you were looking at non-league, you'd be saying Notts County. Notts County is far too big a club to be in non-league. Do you agree? So, you know, that that is one you'd go, i got to buy that club. You know what I mean? It's All it's got is upside. So, yeah, I, I am... Whether the, I don't know if Bradford's the same. And I don't want to, like, disrespect the owner because I respect all owners in the league. And he's been an owner for a few years and he pays his bills. But if he was looking to sell, I am amazed nobody has gone in and, and, and done a deal. Because, again, it's just got upside. And that's always... I've said this to Phil for years. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's... That is a club that just has growth, growth. And I know what you're saying. Down on the training grounds, down on this, down on that. My my thing to that is, don't bring me problems, bring me solutions. You know? So for me, there's a solution to every problem. And I'm sure even for those long-term issues and problems, there are definitely solutions for a club that size. <laughs> just um, talking a little bit more about ownership, because you mentioned about people wanting to buy Bradford. And recently we saw the uh, the Wagme guys come in um, and potentially, I think they said they offered 15 million or 14 million for the club, which is quite a lot. Yeah, that, that's the touted figure. So why didn't he take um, it? That didn't go through. Yeah, I don't think it was that much. I, I have no I mean, idea. So the, they it's put... Not. They talked in the press, I think it was in the Telegraph, in the Daily Telegraph, about having that much money available to them for the project, but that wasn't right. what they were putting in front of Stefan. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, do, do I think a League Two club with no stadium, no training ground, and all those problems that need solutions is worth 15 million? I don't think so. You know, that again, in my opinion, don't shoot the messenger. Do you know what I mean? So everything, everything has a level. The other thing is you look at asset. You know, the reason I was to get, I, able to get a high valuation when I sold half of my club was because I had playing assets that were worth north of 20 million. You know, as backed up by one of them, Ivan Tony went for 10. You know what I mean? Marriott was in there, you know, again. So there, was, there were assets to to say to someone buying, hang on, you're buying a club with these assets that you could sell straight away. So if Bradford was 15 million, I'd be saying, okay, that's a high valuation in League Two. If it was in League One, the top end, and they had young playing assets and there was a deal on the training ground, a deal on this, I'd be like, yeah, you're absolutely right. It is 15 plus million. You know what I mean? So I don't know what the valuations were. Why? Why didn't the deal happen in the end? What was? What was the? What was the end scenario, Phil? With it? Yeah, it was more a. Um, you know, Stefan, uh, from what I understand, didn't believe that this was the right move for the club. So it was less about the money. It was more, you know, as a custodian of the football club, is this the right person to pass it on to? Um, and he didn't feel that that was a responsible thing to do. Okay. Fair play. So, what, what are you- what are your thoughts on um, the obviously the crypto situation? Because they've sold four and a half million pounds worth, haven't they? These NFTs now, and they've actually sold yeah. out of what they've put out there. So it's a lot of money. Um, just I know you've spoke about it before on your own podcast, but I just want to know if you can share with Bradford fans your thoughts on on that situation with crypto. Uh, um, I'm always concerned when someone's buying a football club that's trying to tie in with or say their own business or trying to improve their own business whilst trying to improve because everything that means is tied to their business. It, 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 it's a difficult one. I don't know a lot about the crypto industry, except to say they've lost their arsehole in the last few months. And, you know, some of the biggest crypto funds in the world are going bankrupt. That concerns you, you know. Um, I, I believe they're signing players. I believe they're doing what they've said they've done. So I can only judge an ownership group on a couple of years, a body of work. Forget about the first six months and year. We've had too many grifters come in and promise this, promise this, spend money they actually don't have because it's they've done deals down there. You know, and I'd, I'd not count you've been an example of that from years ago. Everyone was really excited and all this money and Sven Goran Eriksson and going off for this transfer fee and that transfer fee. And then suddenly, like a deck of cards, it fucking collapsed like within uh, 20 months. Right. Um, so I can, you know, I would always say judge an ownership on maybe year three and four onwards. Don't judge them on year one or two because it could be a lot of mistakes, it could be a lot of bullshit. Year three, four. Um, so I, I'm going to reserve judgment on them. And I, as long as they're paying the bills, they're okay with me. You know, it, it, I always say this about any ownership. As long as the ownership pays their bills, pays their players, pays their, you know, fulfills all their commitments, um, they're okay with me as owners. It's going to be an interesting experiment to kind of watch. I'm just glad it's not our club. You know, That's it seems sad. like yeah. it's, it's interesting how they've sold all those NFTs. And so there's, there's obviously demand out there. But the demand isn't some, I don't see this as being scalable. You know, there's a certain number of people who are interested in football and interested in NFTs who have bought these NFTs connected to Crowley. Uh, I, I, I don't get you it. Know, I don't get do you, it. You know, uh, they're paying, Phil, 
you know this shit. Are they JPEGs or GIFs or what are they? These fucking <laughs> NFTs. They're like fucking. Um, I mean, people well, are buying like pictures of monkeys and stuff. No, wasn't it? The, the famous yeah. one. Bod yeah. ape, bod ape yeah. yacht club. Um, you know, so these NFTs <laughs> that they're selling related to Crawley Town is essentially. I don't know if you remember years ago. This is how I think about it. Whether it was this My Club FC or something that owned Ebb's Fleet. And it was, you know, everyone going in and, and making decisions on who they're going to buy and all that stuff. Yes. To me, it's just the modern version of that. You know, you're paying them out of money to now have a say in decisions at the club and we'll give you a, a special edition shirt that no one else can have at the same time. And by the way, you're paying 400 quid for the privilege. Um, right. So that's what it seems to me. And they've sold out because they've got enough people around the world who are interested in this kind of project. But what right. happens in a year's time when they're not got promoted and these people yeah. aren't folks who are inherently interested in, well, maybe football, but certainly not Crawley town. Well, what have they signed with that four and a half million? What have they done business wise? Well, they only sold these NFTs last week. So okay. And every them. agent in the world now knows that they're sitting on all this money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know, who did yeah. they sell? They sell, they, they bought, um, Hang on. let me, let me go get my Vaseline because somebody's going to be working there. I can get it big time. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. So, wow. Well, listen, good luck to them. It, well, the thing is, as well, I, I'm not sure how you'd feel about it, Dara, as well, like, but um, Preston, their CEO, um, has said if they don't achieve everything, I think it's within the next two or three years or so, um, they're going to hold, um, like, a general election for a new CEO, for him to step aside, and then someone else within the Wagme family to come in and take, take over, to, to take it in a different direction. What do you think about that? No, I'm all for democracy and, and voting and, and and everything else, but I, I, I'm not. Phil's laughing there, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm You'd not, be in I'm trouble sure. last year if you did that, <laughs> <at> Posh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Posh was a dictatorship. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is <laughs> a dictatorship. It is. It is. And I, 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 my, I joke with my kids as well that you know I run my family like a dictatorship. There can only be one. You know, and I'm exactly the same. You know, and 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 I, I run my life like that. Because I think when there's too many people trying to make it, I, I'm not big on consensus decision making. I know it comes from Asia years ago and whatever else, but I'm not sure if 4,000 people, you know, are going to make the right decision, you know, on, on some of the key things that when it comes down. I'm not sure I want my football club run that way. Um, so, yes, you want good owners. Yes, you want, you know, good management and everything else. It didn't work with the my football thing. I remember it, Phil. I remember when mm -hmm. it all happened and whatever else. And it blew hot and cold inside of a year. Um, <laughs> It then became Ebbsfleet, I believe, wasn't it? Right. And, and, well, yeah, yeah, they bought Ebbsfleet and then uh, yeah. basically took them bankrupt. Yeah, bankruptcy. correct. Correct. And they were building some theme park or whatever with the state. So, again, pie in the sky nonsense. Um, look, good luck to them. If that's how it's going to be. Um, I Look, I'm not against fan-owned clubs. They run, they do it really well. Exeter, AFC, Wimbledon. But what they don't have is they don't have 10,000 fans making the decisions. They have a board of like four or five key people they trust to make those decisions. Um, you know, putting out votes for a CEO and running it like a general election. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if that belongs in football. Um, but look, what do I know? This is just all about opinion. For me, it's not my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Interesting. The next thing I want to move on to um, is standing and sitting at football matches. So Phil's probably going to smile at this one because we've had a bit of a spat on Twitter about it over the last oh, couple of months. Sure. Uh, just a little bit, just a little one, just a friendly one. Um, so for me, I've always been a standard football, love it. I feel more a part of it and it just, I don't know, it adds to the experience. And I think it's an interesting point because obviously at Peterborough, you've, you've put the seats in, haven't you now, that allow people to stand or sit and it's a choice. Um, so I wondered, sort of, if you don't mind sort of going into it, the costs involved in doing that and the reason that you that you did it, if you don't mind me asking. Um, it was done because we can't use the you know the championship. What we've done now with our three years or whatever we got to be able to stand and whatever else. It was a way for us to navigate that. That when we're back in the championship, we have a stand that's been used. Otherwise, it's going to be closed, and it's like holds two thousand people. So it's really a financial thing. And um, the cost of it was yeah, it was it, it wasn't cheap to do. I think it's getting finished next week. We're hoping to recoup a lot of the cost by selling bits of that stand, you know, and and whatever to the fans. So we're hoping that you know the nest course and whatever else to be instead of half a mil it'll be like 100 150 grand by the time all is said and done no doubt bradford would raise a lot more money because they you know obviously a bigger fan base and a bigger stand if they were to do the same 
Um, I'm okay with it. I think most people will stand, even though the seating is there and whatever else, the rail seating. I guess it's moving with current times. It's the evolution. Premier League's bringing it in, I think, as well. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be in a lot of stadiums. Um, I'm not a stander at game. Then again, I like to sit in the in the posh seats. I like leather on my ass when I'm sat watching the game. I like hospitality when I'm in the I do. I do. I'm, I'm a prawn sandwich guy. You know, at the end of the day, listen, will I go in and, and with, with, with you know, the away fans and away games? Of course, I'd sit in there, no problem. But really, you know, if I'm going to a big sporting event, any game, I want the best money can buy. Uh, I'm, I'm a bit of a snob like that. And I'm at the level of my life where I, I couldn't be arsed with slumming it. So, uh, you, you know, I'm definitely not standing anywhere if I can't help it. Um, so, yeah, that's my opinion on it. Yeah, and I'm, for me, I'm like, I, I, I'm I'm an advocate of safe standing. But it's, um, you know, if you have a standing area, you can stand in. If you're in a, where my challenge is, where you're in seated areas and everyone's standing in a seated area, mm. you know, because yeah. I think that's um pretty selfish of the folks who are standing when there's folks around who want to sit and people who don't have the either ability or you got kids or elderly folks or whatever that then don't see half the match because they're in front of them all standing up and i guess that's where i have the challenge with but safe standing i'm grand i mean imagine safe standing the bottom half the cop um i mean i think that would you know amplify the atmosphere even more at, at valley parade yeah absolutely well, it does, doesn't it? Standing does it does physically improve the the quality of the the crowd and things like that. I mean, there was a video the other day when uh, uh, Flash scored the goal in front of the cop, and it just went mm-hmm. absolutely bonkers at the bottom. It stood up, and it was it was fantastic. Um, and again, like this, we and uh, Phil had a conversation about this on Twitter a couple of weeks ago. And for me, um, at away games, I feel like the atmosphere has improved, and you can really, you know, get the lads going when you stood up and get behind them. And, I know what, what you were saying, though, it's people that haven't got the capacity to be able to stand, but could they get there sooner? Could they sit towards the front of the stand? Is it is it something they could make a choice to do? Um, or yeah. is it just people like me that are really selfish, that want to stand? And, <laughs> you know, that's, that's that's the problem, isn't it, I guess? Uh, but I, I just I just love standing. It's just yeah. what I've always liked to do. And, uh, even at Odds, when I go to rugby league, it's all standing there, isn't it? And, yeah, I just, I just feel like it's part of football for me. Um, but I do, I do understand your point, but I disagree. Mm. <laughs> a little bit <laughs> politely <laughs> yeah politely of course um so just a couple of other bits now going on to peterborough again um and just talking about the youth setup because obviously things are really improving uh, with you guys yeah. so can you tell us a bit about that and what, where things are going yeah so you know we we made a decision about 18 months ago that look we can't keep spending a million million and a half every year on transfer fees it's just for a club our size we could do it when we're in the championship for a good five years in a row but if we're yo-yoing or whatever else we're League One, we just can't do it. So, you know, we made a conscious effort that, look, we want to produce our own talents. The best way to do that is to invest in the uh, academy. And that's seen us go from Cat 3 to Cat 2, which is, you know, the second highest accolade in the land. That means we're contributing basically, you know, one and a half million towards the academy with what we bring, get in. We get about a million and a half in, we have to put a million and a half in. So now the academy is getting two and a half plus million put into it every year from all age levels. You know, we have our dome, our training facilities are better, yeah, 3G, 4G. You know, we now have from under nines all the way through. We'll see the payoff on that in about three years. We're already seeing it. We've got better coaches because we're paying more salaries. and We've got different specialist coaches come in. You know, it, it's going to take a good three years, but we'll be a different football club in three, four years' time because you will see our own products coming through. And instead of selling Ivan Tony for 10 and giving Newcastle a big sell-on percentage, We'd be selling a player from the academy for 10 and keeping the whole lot. And, and instead of millions going out in the sell on, that goes back into our academy. So that, that was just the decision we as an ownership group agreed on, went with, and we finally got the license a couple of months ago. And we are now officially CAT 2. It also helps us when player, you know, our youngsters get stolen by, I say stolen, nicked by clubs higher up. Instead of just getting thrown 100 grand for a 12 year old, we now might get 300 grand. You know, that makes a big difference as well. And we have lost some talented kids over the last few years. But I've managed to navigate and pretty much force Premier League clubs to pay us more than the standard 80 grand or whatever else. You know, last year, I think two of them went, we got 1.2 million from two of them. And they never really played for the first team. So with this new category, we can keep doing that. So that's where we are with, with our academy. We're really proud of it. We've got some good people. Our under-23s is really good as well who's our previous under-18 academy managers who won the league two years in a row are now in the under-23. So it's also a great progression for coaches to come all the way through as well. And that's really important, the continuity from first team all the way through, from formations, from ideology regarding sports science to coaching, 
mindsets and everything else. It's all the same. And I think that's really important. So I'm not sure what Bradford's uh, academy status is or what they do there or uh, Blizzardville. I, I, I imagine it's Cat 3. Okay. Um, but, uh, and probably the, you know, there's not the investment there yet to be able to do any more than that yet. And, you know, that's where you'll have got, I mean, I know you got stick last year when on the pitch people are crying out for you to, you know, invest more money in the squad, whatever that means and whatever that looks like, you know, and you're putting a million and a half into Cat 2 you know, balancing that trade-off because fans, like you say, are not necessarily going to see that. Although, here you are with folks like Ronnie Edwards and Harrison Burroughs from your academy who are playing yep. 20, 30, 40 championship games already uh, yep. that you wouldn't be able to buy that quality of talent uh, because it'd be too expensive Yeah, we, we, we had eight out of the 24-man squad in Portugal were from our academy. And, you know, four of them collectively are probably worth an air 20 plus million if I wanted mm. to sell them. Um, and that would be Edwards, that would be Ricky J. Jones, that would yeah. be Harrison Burroughs, that would be, you know, who else have I missed in there? You know, there, there's a good batch of them and that are worth money. Um, that also are very good players for our first team squad while yeah. still teenagers and, and young. Um, it, it has to be the way. It's the only way you can run a, a fiscally sound, well-run football club while still trying to be successful. So at the moment, I'm like still investing and buying players and producing from the academy. Eventually, it goes the other way, where at the moment, it might be 80% still buying players, 20% academy. It might be 80-20 academy, 20% the odd gem, you know, that I might steal or buy from Bradford. So, yeah, you know, that that's that's the way it is at the moment, Jeff. You, you know, you um, you talked about how you uh, you lost a couple last year, but they brought in, you know, 1.2. A uh, year before, you lost Flynn Clark, who went to Norwich, who's now been farmed out on loan to Walsall. And, you know, rather than playing... Um, in the first team for posh is you know trying to get a gig out there how do you how do you keep the youngsters like from not following the bright lights of oh a, a premier league uh, 23s team uh, he, he was a, he was one that really irks me still i don't like talking about it you know super talented he would have definitely played 20 plus games in the champ last year um, he'd already played for us 10 plus times in league one the year before mm-hmm. He had a year left. His agent, you know, I've, I've got no time for his agents and the people that were surrounding the deal. Um, he's with an agency that's owned by like a movie star, believe it or not. It's been in lots of like um, gangster type movies and big Hollywood movies. It's all very bizarre. Um, but we knew early on that is that they were not going to sign a new deal. And at that stage, and we just like, you know, we're washing our hands with this. We sold it for Norwich. And we'd said to him at the time, you will play with us in the champ. And then you'll have that year, and then you'll be firmly in the first team. And now he's playing a league below us. So, you, you know, I, I don't know who's got the better end of the deal. I guess time will tell. I hope for his sake and his parents' sake and his family's sake that he kills it at Warsaw, he gets called back by Norwich, and he makes it the big time. Because we've got another three million in games. We've got another million in promotion add-ons, and we've got a big sell-on. So if he comes off at of Norwich, we could get another two, three, four million out mm-hmm. of the deal. So I hope, to, I hope he's grown up. I hope he's ready. You know, and I hope he rips it up in League Two, but it frustrates the shit out of me because he would have he would have been a part of the starlet batch we've got at the moment. But him and his agents and those around them thought it was wiser to go another route. How, how do you train? You know, just generally keep them in, like keep the youngsters in the academy as opposed to going to, you know, getting stolen. It's, it, 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 it's difficult. So what you try and do is you try and play on the parents of well, hang on. Do you really want to be driving to Man City four times a week? Do you really want to be making that? You're, you're local to Peterborough. We had a goalie that was 13 and every top 10 Premier League club wanted him. I think he ended up choosing either uh, Villa or Man City. I can't remember. Um, but again, some we win, some we lose. We kept a couple this summer that we thought we were going to lose. One was a very, very good product. And what you then got to try and do is make sure the processes are in place, the scholarship uh, agreement, the pre-pro contract, all those things. Once you have all those things in place, you can protect yourself a lot more. Mm-hmm. You know, we lost Adler last year as a Portuguese starlet, you know, yeah. Palace and his age his agent ended up making a fortune out of the deal, nearly as much as the transfer fee. That is nearly impossible to contend with. That went to a tribunal. We ended up getting whatever. Um, but he's somebody that could have, you know, if he played five times in the championship at 16, 17, he could be worth two, three, four million. So again, some you win, some you lose. What I try and do is be ahead of the game with the pro deals and then Keep them growing. You know, Ricky's had two pro contracts. Benji's had two. Harrison's had two, soon to be three. Ronnie's had two, soon to be three pro contracts. Rewarding them every cup, every, you know, I put in the contract, every 20 appearances, we'll talk again about a new contract. Don't have to do it, but we're going to talk about it. And I, as a chairman, I'm a man of my word. I back it up. 
So the minute they've played 20, agent, player, right. You know what? You're on 400 quid a week. Let's get you on 600 and 700. Let's you know keep the incentives going. You know, where now you've got your Rickies, your Harrisons, your Ronnies. We're now earning, you know, nearly six figures a year because they've played over 50 games for the football yeah. club. They deserve to earn with the rest of the squad. But you don't want to give it too soon. And sometimes you'll get agents going, well, we want two grand a week, 17-year-old. I'm like, no, I don't care if he's Ronaldinho. He's not getting two grand a week because it's too much, too soon, too fast. And that's a recipe for disaster. I, I cringe when I see 18-year-olds in the Premier League on 40 grand a week. I think it's wrong. I think it's morally wrong. I think that doesn't help create good human beings. It doesn't help create good footballers. And I think it's a recipe for disaster. And I've cried out for the last two years that we should have a system in place that caps youngsters at X amount until they turn legal age. Even if you were to put the money in a trust fund for them until they got to an age. Not that you don't want to rob them of the potential to earn, but you want to make sure they turn into good human beings and, and, and responsible adults. Yeah, I like the sound of that. I think it'd be a really good thing to do because you see it all the time. You know, they get caught out doing things and whatever else. Too much. So, I just, on that point as well, in a way, I want to open it up a little bit and talk about your openness as a chairman. You're not scared sure. to share your views and things like that. So, have you found that that in the main has been quite positive or has it been negative? Or like, how have you found that you coming across as your own personality and just saying what you feel as a chairman yeah, of the football club? How have you been? I, I don't apologise for who I am. I don't, I don't make loads of friends because of it. There are a lot of owners, a lot of other clubs who might be quite jealous, you know, of the business we've done and the way I am. And then there'll be a lot of people I know who like what I do. And like during COVID, quite a few of them wanted me to do what I did because I firmly believed it was ridiculous shutting down our game. Um, as I've been vindicated two years later to be right all along. You know, footballers were never in danger of dying of COVID. And, you know, that was very apparent early on. So um, as Phil knows, I kind of went out there and said that very early on. Um, not everyone on everyone's cup of tea, I understand that, but I'm not out. When I set out in life to be successful and do well, I'm not out to win popularity contests. I don't have a lot of friends because I don't need a lot of friends. Um, you know, Phil's probably only one of my only friends I can name on one hand. So, uh, um, <laughs> you, you, you know, but I, the people I do spend time with and talk to, I have to trust because it's tough to trust people in this world. Um, you know, so I see too many people in football, they think, you know, they want to be popular. They want to win votes. They want to be on board. They want to do this. They want to do that. It's all political. I don't do politics. I do truth. Hence why our podcast is called The Hard Truth. And sometimes my truth can be a little bit too hard and it can basically like cut right to the bone. But I'd rather be that way than be a two-faced fucker. You know, so you take me as you see me. If that puts people off, that's your problem. You know, uh, I'm not going to apologize for who I am, nor should I. And I would tell my children and anyone's kids the same. You know, stick to your guns, believe in your principles, and be you. You know, don't be who someone else wants you to be. Absolutely. And podcast-wise, so again, this is directed probably at you, Phil, as well, a little bit here. So how did this come about, the Hard Truth uh, podcast? Uh, the Right Hard Truth podcast as well. So sorry for <laughs> <that one>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still here, by the way. No um, so how did that come about? It was pretty random, to be honest with you. You know, I was... Um, I, Dara had put out a couple of podcasts on his own uh, just the beginning of COVID and I'm always on the search for interesting pods and I stumbled across it I think on a, a run one day listened in and um, and Dara had mentioned his email address in there and I'm like okay that's pretty accessible um, and you know I think maybe there's a couple of things we can do on uh, helping to bring some structure to it and uh, I knew that Dara lived relatively locally I didn't know quite how locally and so I just reached out um you know said here's some things i think that maybe we could do together and um we uh, we grabbed a coffee i think it was a that was the first person out of covid from my family that i'd uh, uh, seen <laughs> during covid <laughs> um and we, you know, we just figured why not and it, it kind of went from there you know we did a, a business podcast as well in the summer last summer it was and uh maybe spring as well so we did a couple of different things and we've experimented yep. a bit but um, that's kind of how we got the ball rolling. It's been and a good partnership. See... Yeah, do you know what? It's, it's such a good listen. You work really well together. Um, it's <laughs> I don't know, you're different people and it just it balances. It's, it's like yin and yang almost, I guess. It, it, yeah, yeah. The, polar, <laughs> yeah, the, the polar opposites, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it is such a good listen and it's, it's successful and you can see why. But I just want to know what, what your plans are for, you know, going forward. Is it something you... Because you release, like, does it... 
maybe one or two a month you do at the minute. We try and do every week during the season. Yes. Um, you know, and sometimes that gets, you know, travel and stuff like that gets in the way. Um, but, you know, Phil's that's... become our... too successful. Phil's, yeah. Phil's become this really successful guy now, so I can hardly get him on it twice a month. That's why we don't do it every week. And obviously he's, he's getting too rich now. <laughs> yeah. I need to come back to you asking. For, I've had my 20 appearances. Exactly, yeah. To talk about How much? Contract. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> No, but Phil's right. We try. Look, I mean, life gets in the way. You know, Phil is growing a business. Though. I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of him. That's becoming very successful. So he's obviously traveling a lot more. Obviously, when I'm over in the, I try and make myself available to do it whenever we can. Yeah. But I'm also always very aware. I'm working around Phil's schedule. That if he's got his own stuff going on and whatever, because he doesn't earn any money from the podcast, so I don't want to get in the way of him building a life for himself and his family, which is more important than the podcast. So we work around all those things. But we're going to try and get you know some consistency in this season's ones for sure and try and get that in every single week you know last year we had international breaks with a lot of stuff going on it was just kind of a little bit messy mm-hmm. so we're going to try and at least get 35 plus minimum if not 40 done in, in season three talking of international breaks how are you um feeling about the world cup being november rather than summer hate it hate it because right now we'd be watching and enjoying them you, 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 you know I, I, listen i'm not getting involved with all the you know, the, the human rights crap that every journalist wants to write about, virtue signal about whilst they jump on an Emirates flight and go and enjoy themselves in November. Um, I don't want to get into all of that, but I, I, I hate it. I hate the way it was done. I hate the way they got it. I hate the fact that it's going to be that time of the year. I'd love to go, but because it's that time of the year, it's fucking impossible for me to go. I've got like three birthdays and fucking anniversaries and Thanksgiving. <laughs> so, you, you know, other than that, I'd be there because I think it'd be like, it'd be awesome to be there because when I say awesome, the, the hotels, the, the 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 local culture, and whatever else, as regards to food, cuisine. I love Dubai, so for me going there, I'd have enjoyed it. Um, but of course, an arm and a leg. It's ridiculously expensive. What I hate there is it takes away from the normal football fan will not be able to afford to go to that. It will be so expensive. Do you know what I mean? So they really didn't think it through. I hope it never happens again. And you know, let's get back to the summer because I love going on holiday in June. My missus is wearing her England shirt. I'm sat there with no shirt because Ireland is shit and don't qualify. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, my kids all pretend to be English every time an England game is on, even though they got Irish passports, the little fucking gits. Uh, so so I really enjoy, I, I enjoy the Euros and the World Cup. Like every two years, we've got something in the summer to watch. So I don't know how the rest of you feel, but I'm gutted. Yeah, yeah I have to totally agree. agree. It's just strange, isn't it? It's, it's going to be really odd it being at the end of the year. I can't get my head around it because the season's starting earlier as well. It's having a bit of a you know an effect on our season. But yeah, it's strange. Um, and I just I don't I don't think that it's just all wrong in it. Really, let's be honest. How they've won it and stuff. It's it should be in uh, in England or Ireland. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like anything, any sport now. Boxing's the same. It's the highest bidder, and it's always that you know over that way. Unfortunately, um, so, yeah, they'll be golf. They'll be coming. They'll be coming to us next. Though in yeah, uh, well, so... that, that, I've I've said to Natalie Phil that you know we're get, obviously our kids will all be at college by then, yeah. you know, touch wood and everything else. And I said, look, we got to wherever it's on in three, four cities in Mexico. I'm not going to Canada, fucking no way. But Mexico and America, I would definitely like you know jet in and out and, and mm-hmm. like hit every single location. That that's going to be it's going to be hot when they come like you know to the states, but it's going to be good fun. So uh, yeah, I'm look, I'm looking forward to that. You know. At least those countries are ready for it, though. Like you say, it's not, yeah, yeah. it's just not developed enough, is it? Um, where it is this time, but Qatar, I just, it's just not right. But, well, uh, I, you know, I went down into Brazil, um, to Manaus, which was the game in the Amazon, you know, and they're building these stadiums for one game. And they, spe- you know, there's so much poverty stupid. there. It's that they spend all this for a fight, and it was a beautiful stadium that you could easily lift up and put into any championship team and perhaps even Premier League team. And it's been probably used... a bus station there, exactly. It's been used three times, and that's it in the middle Ridiculous. of the jungle. Ridiculous, it should be, it should be going to the places where the infrastructure is. If the infrastructure is not in place, waste the fucking time and waste yeah. the money. So we have to stop with that. Um, there's far too much. I'm not going to mention the word corruption, but there's far too much influence pedals, you know, to send World Cups in Europe, you know. We saw last year, bar the final, how good the Euros were, you know, in the UK. You know, all the chaos in the final, that's another story. Um, so to have it like a World Cup in, in Scotland, Wales, England, Ireland, you know, Northern Ireland, that, that's phenomenal. You know, that's atmosphere, that's proper. And, uh, you know, we've got to get the World Cup over here, for sure. You know, and, and sooner rather than later. 
it's easy access as well, like you say. You get a flight to, to Ireland for nine quid, and you know if you were based in the UK, you just get everywhere. It's so easy. Yeah, it's great fun, you know. So that's the way it should have been done. So it's going to go down. It, for me, it'll be won by a South American team because of the temperatures. England have got no yeah. chance because they're going to melt. Um, they never do historically well in like hot countries anyway at World Cup. So I don't know what the statistics are, but I would imagine most hot temperatures when you go over 40 or 50 are won by South American teams, those World Cups. So I would imagine the South American team are going to be winning that World Cup, in my opinion. Argentina for me. Right. I like the prediction. We're going to ask you a bit more about some predictions as well uh, in a few moments. But just before we get on to that, I know we're sort of running out of time a little bit. Um, have you got any advice um, on us, obviously, doing the podcast? Because you guys have done it a little bit longer. Have you got any advice you can give us or any words of wisdom, guys? I think, from my perspective, have balance. You know, you, if, you, if you're both in the same train, you know, train of thought, that's wrong. I think you need to get someone that's completely different from you. I think people listen to podcasts because they want to, you know, me and Phil speak. Yes, we agree on some things, but lots of things fundamentally we're different on. And we have those little debates sometimes on the podcast, off the podcast, but respectfully. You know, at the end of the day, it wouldn't stop, it wouldn't stop me having dinner or, or mm. lunch or a drink with Phil because we have completely different political views. There are lots, there's lots of stuff family we agree on. You know, come football, we're a little bit aligned. But sometimes we'll differ. So I think if you both are the same, you need someone else. Um, you know, it's good to be controversial. Don't be frightened about, about things that you think are taboo or, oh, I'm going to stay away from that. Or, you know, back in the day, we were talking about Black Lives Matter on my podcast. Yeah. We were talking about all these things. You know, we didn't shy away because we were worried about, you know, we, we spoke about, you know, men being girls and girls being boys a few weeks ago. And we felt, you know, I gave quite a, you know, a big speech on pronouns and all that crap that, you know, Woketopia has taken over. So, <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't shy away from the things you think, shit, I'm going to get hammered here. Because, Always remember this, far too many of the 2 and 3% have been listened to nowadays. The other 97% agree with you. So always remember that in your brain. Don't get bullied by the 3%, thinking of 90%, 7% of your horse. So that's mine. Phil will have maybe his own thoughts. Yeah, I would say, you know, be yourself is really important because, you know, I've done, from a business podcast perspective as well, I've probably done five, six hundred 600 um, at this point and in the early days I would always try and be something that I thought I should be rather than something that I was and it probably took me 50 podcasts or so to realize screw this who am I trying to be something else for it's like either they like you or they don't like you um, so I think that's important and then the other thing is just consistency you know keep yeah. showing up and people will find you um, yeah. and there may be times when your numbers dip or your plateau or whatever you know podcasting is a long game and so you just need to keep showing up and Word of mouth, you know, will will bring more people in, and that's how you'll grow. Absolutely, that's great. Thank you, guys. I think to be honest, we've seen it a little bit here on Twitter. There's a few. It's few, like I say, like you said, probably ninety percent, ten percent, whatever. Um, but you know what? We're enjoying it. That's a big thing. You're talking about something that you're so interested and passionate about, so it's just natural to to do that. So, and I really appreciate that. Um, last couple of bits then before we let you go, because I'm sure Dara's got things to do in the transfer world before the season begins. And <laughs> your busy he's, got, he's, got, he's got kids to nick from us. <laughs> <laughs> You've got signed Dion, please. Uh, <laughs> I've already texted my manager. Keep an eye on him. Um, so predi predictions for the season then for we'll start with Peterborough um, from both of you and then we'll do Bradford as well so where, where do you think Peterborough are likely to finish this season might be hard for you to say as a chairman but just out of interest what do you think I don't, I don't love doing predictions um, I think you know we've got a very strong squad um, touch wood if we can stay away from the dreaded I word you know fitness form injury um, we'll go up um, if we don't, you know, it'll be tough. League One, you have to respect. There's so many fallen giants in that league. And every year we've won, we've come up against the Leeds, a Southampton, a Brighton, a Sheffield Wednesday, a Sheffield United, a Leicester, who pipped us to the title. You know, massive, massive clubs. Last time Hull beat us by two points to the title. So we'd like to go one better, but nobody's going to hand you a promotion. So if our players' heads in the right place and, and go out there and, and, and do the business, we, we've got a very, very good chance. Yeah, and I would, and maybe I'm a little biased as well on Posh and kind of following what's been going on. But they've got a squad that, the squad last year was good enough to stay up, but they had a lot of fitness and injury problems and, you know, stuff that was addressed coming into the season that was perhaps, um, you know, things at the beginning of last season that didn't show themselves until it was too late to fix. So all those things have been addressed. Um so they've got the squad, no doubt, to go straight back up again. Now, 
football's not that easy, as we all know. But um, need a bit of luck. Posh, yeah, if I was a posh fan, I'd be going in um, enthusiastically into the League One campaign because um, if if they don't, it's either bad luck or you know they've shot themselves in the foot. Correct. Yeah. I'd, I'd say the same. I, I feel like your squad's brilliant. That this, I love your striker, um, Johnson, uh, Clark Harris. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation of his name, but I think he's absolutely fantastic. Um, and I, I just think you'll bounce back up. I really do. And hopefully you can build from that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You've got your fans standing up now to get behind him, so you'll be, you'll be all yeah. right. Exactly. <laughs> Um, just, Bradford, um, as well. Go on, Phil, if you've got something else to say on that, sorry. No, I was going to say on City, I mean, I I always come into the start of the season enthusiastic and then, you know, it takes you three months to realise that maybe <laughs> things weren't as good as they were. But, I mean, the quality of players we've brought in, the depth, I think that's what's different this year is that we've got quality, but we've also got depth. I mean, I think there's going to be five or six people that go out between now and the end of this um, transfer window. Um, but with the manager we've got, I mean, we've got an assistant who is a perfectly good manager in his own right as well, in Glenn Hodges. Um, we've got the squad. We should be getting promoted this year. And, you know, I say, say that not out of hope, but I think we've done something wrong. Some Something bad has happened if we don't. I, I think anything less than autos is probably going to be seen as a failure this season with, this, with the squad that we're, we're assembling. I, I, I can't see as being... I, I think playoffs would be disappointing to, to leave it down to that for, for this for the caliber of player that we've brought in as well so far this preseason I, I I think anything less than autos is a, is a bit of a failure for me I agree I think uh, it's finally time so uh, but I, but I would say this to Bradford fans um temper the expectations until November onwards it mm -hmm. might take two or three months for all the new signings to gel for the magic to find his feet and having a crowd that big is sometimes brilliant, but also sometimes a hindrance when you do have a slow build-up. So I would say if I were the manager, yes, talk about promotion, but also talk about give us a few months to get going. Brilliant. And just the last question. I said that last time, but I'm going to ask you another one. Um, and this is to both of you. Um, so let's say at Bradford to start with, if you could sign one more player now um, before the end of the season, um, who would you sign for Bradford? Who do you think would make a difference? I mean, let's we talk within reason. You're not going to talk talk about Ronaldo or anything like that, but who would you who would you sign? Um, I mean, I think that you know the gap that we talked about at the beginning, and obviously Dion Pereira is a good fit for that. But I feel that if there's if it's not him, there's going to be some other left wingers attacking uh, players. There's a, could... there's a there's a player you need to sign that I saw yesterday. Mm hmm. There's a player, he's, 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 he's a left wide player who, who, yeah. who's had a couple of down seasons and there's probably value in doing a deal for him right now. And he's been at Barnet too long and he should have gone with Jack Taylor a couple of years ago. And um, he, he he terrorized our right side yesterday uh, for both our goals. And he's 23. And he would comfortably, you know, if he had his head screwed on and he went to a club your size, 10 goals, 10 assists, left side. Easy, easy all day long in your sleep. Probably going to cost you. Probably going to cost you two hundred grand because I know mm -hmm. Tony's like a barn and if not a bit more. Um, but an absolute worse stack than those areas. If we weren't, he'd be a player we'd look at. Just my humble opinion. What do I know about recruiting players? You have to <laughs> ping me his name later. Yeah, yeah. and then we'll oh, send well. it to we'll send it to Jen. We'll get it. We'll get it in his inbox. Oh, well. um, so, what about Posh then? I mean, if you if Posh could sign one more player, what where would you be looking at? Um, I mean, obviously, if you say you probably it, are looking at players. But... It, it, if 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 Ronnie went, you know, there might be one more there. But we've got a couple of young centre halves coming through that look awesome. If Jono went, there is a player I want, but there's no point in having him. You know, I see some fans today moaning about what injuries, this, that, and we need one more of this, one more of that. You, you can't just stack them up in a cupboard. You know, Jack Marriott and Johnson Clark Harris are vying for one position. That's two former Golden Boot winners, you know, in, in, in League One. Um, you know, the wide players, there's two in every position. Central midfield, there's five in there, the two go into five. You know, defensively, again, our fans, I heard them today talking about left back and right back. You know, right now we're playing Burroughs and Ward, who are wing backs or wingers, but the manager wants to play them left and right back because they're just as good at this level there and can still give you everything you need, plus the wide players in front of them. So, and then center half, Knight, Kent, Edwards, uh, Nathan Thompson, Fernandez, again, stacked. Um, you know, sometimes you can sign too many players and then you get unhappy players. 
because there's only you know eleven can only start. Um, so it would only be if somebody left, whether it be a Schmodux or a Clark Harris or, or an Edwards, then you go and uh, I've got my list. I know what I'm doing. You know, I go A, B, C, and D. It's ready. Um, so as long as it's not the last day of the window, because that becomes problematic then. But right now, there's no point in us signing another player because you just you're getting greedy. Like I said, I could have left with the boy from Barnet yesterday. You know, two years ago we played them. I said the same thing about him. You know what I mean? So, um, but uh, I'm looking at it and going, well, there's three players down that side. It's, 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 you know, one of them cost me a million quid last year. You know, it's uh, and Ricky's the other one. So we got like our, our balance of youth and and, and 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 normal players. So yeah, as greedy as you want to be, keep signing, keep signing. Sometimes it's not always about the players you don't have. Think about the players you just haven't seen that you do have. So on that depth question, and, and Phil, I'm going to bring you on this one as well, on both of you, because uh, there's obviously the Andy Cook situation we've got now, because yeah. we've brought Vidain in, who's probably going to be the main one, in my opinion, I think he will be. Is, is Andy Cook somebody that we should keep hold of, or is he, is he a big enough character that he wants to be a main man somewhere else? You know, the thing with, uh, and Andy Cook played really well yesterday. You know, he looked like he was fitter than he's been for a long time and, and sharper and everything. But I would expect that he would probably go. You know, Andy Cook is a, is a player who plays in one position. You know, you can put him up front in that, you know, is in the box and that's his one thing. Whereas some of the other attackers can play left, they can play right, they can drop off. You know, there's a lot more flexibility. So I think that he's probably, if we let one go, he's the last man standing. Um, financially as well, I think it'll depend on, um, you know, who else we end up letting go and, um, you know, if we're bringing any other money in from folks that we're letting go. But I wouldn't be surprised to see him go. Um, you know, you've got some of the, the youngsters, I think, who will end up going out on low, like um, Finn Cousin Dawson, probably Reese Staunton, if we can find somewhere for Reese to go. Um, Keon Scales, maybe, but maybe they'll keep him to have another look at, given how well he's started preseason. Um, and the other Don't one forget, for me that's bigger little- benches. Bigger benches, Phil. Yeah. You've got like, was it, is it 19 this, or whatever yeah. else? Plus, you, you're allowed to make five subs. So mm-hmm. some of those young players might actually be more involved than you think because you don't want to be getting yeah. them out on loan. You, you know what I mean? They're going to yeah. be good. Sorry, you were going to talk about one more player. No, I, and uh, the other one was Jan Songo, you know, who is he a centre-half? Is he a midfielder? He did better at centre-half, but we stacked there. Is he good enough for a mid- midfielder? Does he want to see himself in the first team? Probably. So that's a question mark. We're no on the squad depth. Like we've got 28 in the squad at the moment, and that seems a little heavy for us. Um, so, how many? I mean, what's what's your ideal squad side, Stara? 20, 24. 21 out, three goalies. 24. Yeah. And then and then we have the under 23 team. Um, right. And in the, in the under 23 team, then I think we have like 15. So, you, you know, yes, we have more than 40 pros in the building. But if you go first team squad 24, mm-hmm. it's 23s you're going to have here. But you've had Joe Taylor come from the 23s. You know, you you know, yesterday Andrew did really well from there. Charlie O'Connell. You know, they're suddenly from playing 23 football, they're, they're, they're looking fucking good. Do you know what I mean? And, and that's really benefited them. So 24 is the first team. Like I said, we're going to have 21 traveling away from home. You know, I was around with the management team about this. Why do you need 21 hotels, cost, you know, mm-hmm. fuck. But I understood their logic. You know, now that you can make five subs, now there's like seven, eight, nine on the bench, you know. So your younger players probably won't go out on loan if you think about it. Mm-hmm. You know, if, because if you if you trim that down, it's like getting everyone in that squad and match that. Yeah, it's, well, it's a balance, isn't it, between they're cheap, so you don't need to go and pay somebody more to replace them Correct. to sit on the bench, and them actually Correct. getting experience. Yeah, so what you do is you put them on loan with a 28-day callback or you do a youth loan where you can call them back in 24 hours. So that way then they're getting football, but they can still train with you and you can call them back quicker. Do right. you know what I mean? So that, that that's another solution to that scenario, you know? Sweet. Um, before we Fantastic. wrap up as well, boys, um, Phil, I've, I'm, I'm, I've been wanting to ask you. Um, so you're a Bantam abroad. Yeah. Um, how... How how is it for you being um, a city fan, diehard city fan, and you're miles away? Like, how do you feel the club's engagement for fans around the world uh, has grown over the last few years for you? And and do you still feel as connected to the club as you did when you were able to go week in week out? Yeah, you know, it's a great question, and I think it's changed over time. Like, I moved to uh, to the states in two thousand and five, so it's been what, 17 years now. And even before that, I lived down in Kent and down in uh, Essex, although I'd drive up every week for all the games, um, even though uh, 
you know, I was uh, was not based locally. You know, when I moved out to the States, it was really hard. You know, the first World Cup, for example, in 2006, which was Germany, no one gave a crap about. You know, football wasn't even talked about. I could I could listen to Radio Leeds games on the internet, um, and I did that for a while. But, you know, as we started to go down and, and play worse, then you kind of feel a little bit more disconnected. What really changed it for me was one, well, the cup runs, you know, the turn in form and fortunes when we started to do well again, that you wanted to really re engage more. Yeah. Um, but also I follow, you know, so I follow is a godsend. I know so many people complain about I follow and oh, it's not got the production qualities of sky or whatever it is that people are expecting, but to actually be able to watch the games um, yeah. while nothing ever replaces being at a game. Um, you know, I've probably watched more games than a typical city fan over the last five years because, you know, I watch them home and away, um, you know, every Saturday, every Tuesday on iFollow. So that really Religious. helped my connection. Right. And that, <laughs> so that really helped my connection, you know, kind of yeah. uh, to feel as though I'm back engaged um, and, you know, can have opinions about players as opposed to just what I heard about them on the radio. No, no, no that makes perfect sense. That, that kind of leads me on to like the 3 p.m. blackout over here for the eye follow like i live in south wales so it's not as far as you away but i don't get that luxury being able to watch i follow because mm -hmm. i'm in the uk um i personally think times are moving on now it's time for that 3 p.m black get rid of us to be gone get rid of us because yeah, get rid of us. streaming it, it is the next it is the next evolution in watching i, football I, I agree i agree yeah i agree with simon jordan says it all the time about the netflix and football I agree. I, I, I think now we, we should be able to offer the product universally for X a month and split it amongst all the clubs. I think we could bring millions more in. We got a lot more money than the TV deals on the table. Do away with the, the 3 p.m. issue. Bradford fans, posh fans, aren't going to not go to a game because it's available on stream. They're going to go to the game. You, yeah. You're saying 95% hardcore, and the flip of the money will outweigh the 5% that don't come. So it, it's time to do away with it and make it available for everyone in the UK, around the world, to watch a uh, uh, proper package. So I agree with you. Dara, what do you make of the clubs who, the smaller clubs who grumble about the fact that the bigger clubs are getting the, the revenue, the iFollow revenue, for a, on a per-match basis? I, I, I know who you're talking about there. Right. So I, 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 um, I sympathise. I understand the argument. I get the argument totally. You know, we, we took ourselves out of iFollow. We got Posh Plus. We, 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 we obviously have come away and we do our own streaming. And we do everything else. You know, I, I, I get Andy Holt's argument on that. It's, mm -hmm. it's very slanted, you know, and, and, and with the revenue and everything else. That needs to be fixed. But I also say that if we went out and did our own EFL Plus and basically had our own commentators, our own uh, setup, charged universally, I don't know, 30 quid a month, 40 quid a month, whatever it might be around the world, I think the subscribers that would sign up would outweigh the TV money we get from Sky. Mm -hmm. And I think we would all share in that a lot better than we're doing at the moment. If, if we went to Bradford tomorrow and said, you're getting an extra mil and a half a year than the previous year, on top of all your, your streaming and sky money and everything else, an extra mil and a half, yes or no? Bradford will go yes. Posh will go yes. And we'd be like, goodbye, Sky. Goodbye, everyone else. It's now EFL+. Plus. And, yeah. and, and that's the way it is. And I'd sign up for it. I'd pay 40 quid a month yeah. if you ever watch Bradford, Posh, whoever yeah. I wanted. Do you know what I mean? And get everything on there and, and highlights and, and archives mm -hmm. and anything you want. And I, and I just think as a product, that's, you know, Amazon, Apple, look at where they're all going, what you're streaming, your Netflix, you know, Apple have just paid 3 billion for NFL Sunday ticket. I used to have it on direct TV. It's now on Apple. They've just paid 2.7 billion for the MLS. The biggest MLS deal that's ever been done. I spoke about this a couple of years ago. The MLS, you know, would do better because of the streaming wars that are coming. So, Everything is streaming now. Well, we're still fucking arguing about blackouts and 3 p.m.s and sky deals and this, that, whatever else. It's right there in front of us. I've been saying it for two years. Spend the money to do a property on what we can bring in before the next TV deal expires. And let's put our balls on the table and go hell for leather and agree to do it and, 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 and build it. Because I think there's just so much more money for all of us. And we can, we can get the equality right between the champ league, one league two, and even the prem. So just my thought. Ball on for me, that is, to be fair. Like I to I totally agree with all, all of that, to be honest. Um it 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 does make financial sense. Like it, given the opportunity, if I can get to a game, I'm going to a game, whether I've played for EFL plus or not. So given the opportunity, I am I am heading to that game, whether it's home, away, wherever. 
Um, but but yeah, to- totally agree with you. I think it's time Sky's Sky BT sort of bidding wars. They're getting a bit left behind now because of, because of the streaming platforms. You see Prime taking a lot more from the Premier League side now. It, it's where it's going, and we definitely, I, I think we definitely need to be looking at an EFL Plus where, ev- like I said, everything you like is name? universally ah, You available. like that name? EFL Plus. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Give it right there, right? There, I hope you've yeah. trademarked uh, that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, let me make a note. <laughs> NFT. <laughs> <laughs> it is an NFT. Protect it. <laughs> right, um, yeah. This is the way. So it's been an absolute pleasure to have you both on. I mean, I could sit here and I'm sure Andy could and speak to you both afternoon about football. It's what we like to do, in it? But um, we're going to leave you to your Sunday afternoons to spend it with your families. Um, so thank you both very much for coming on. And hopefully we'll speak to you Thank you, again. lads. Go, yes. go posh, go Banthams. Let's have a yeah. win double, double season. That's it. Double promotion on the podcast this year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's celebrate. Thank you very much, guys. Take <laughs> care. Thanks, lads. Take care, boys. Sorry.